Trouble. Let's get uh, started once again on our lesson tonight. Uh, I just want to do a little bit of a review because some of the things we looked at last week are really, really important uh, to remember to keep track of. You remember we talked about Revelation, that God has revealed himself to us, and he's revealed himself in two different ways. You remember natural revelation and special revelation. Do you all remember uh, what natural revelation is all about or what, what is entailed in uh, natural revelation? I remember nature. I remember yeah. what we can see visibly around us. Yeah, exactly. So uh, let's call it creation, all right? So God revealed himself in creation. And, and what else? Is that another area in which God reveals himself outside of scripture? He reveals himself in nature. The heavens declare the glory of God. But there's another inner part of us in which God reveals himself. Remember what it was? When you do right or wrong, something bothers you. What is it? Your conscience. Your conscience. All right, so the, those, those two areas are uh, the areas in, in which God reveals himself in a natural way through creation, through the things that he's made. Uh, a, a creature requires a what? Creator. A creator, right? Uh, you know, a building requires a what? A builder. It's, it's normal, it's natural. A painting requires a what? A painter. And so it all follows, it's, it's, it's logic, isn't it? It is, it's kind of illogical to think that a painting can just appear or that a building can just appear. They all need uh, something to have it happen. And, and so when you look at creation, it's, it's not logical to think that we would have the complexity of planets and the universe that we have and that there would be no creator. Some people believe in the Big Bang, but the question is, is who, who lit the Big Bang? Mm -hmm. who start, there has to be somebody who did that. And uh, we believe that to be God by the way he has revealed himself to us through special revelation. And uh, that was another area. Do you remember what the areas of special revelation were? I gave you some clues. M, S, D, V, and P, W. <laughs> you, can you think of what it is? What, what would M be? What did Jesus perform? When he, miracles. miracles. All right. So in special revelation, there are the miracles, uh, both Old Testament and New. All right. Um, what else were there? It starts with S. Signs. Signs. All right. So there were signs. Uh, things that occurred. Uh, D and V. Joseph had a lot of these. Dreams and visions. Dreams and visions, right? Mm -hmm. So there were dreams and visions. And then finally, P and W. Prophecy and something else. For, yeah, prophets and the Word of God. All right, the prophets of the Old Testament. And then finally, the Word of God. And, and actually, the ultimate revelation is really the Word of God. Uh, our scriptures, that's why today we function with the scriptures alone. We no longer have necessarily miracles, signs, dreams, and wonders. We have the Word of God. It's, it's uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. God has spoken to us in various ways, but in these last days, He has spoken to us through His Son. And so we have the Word of God now that gives us complete revelation. Then we looked at the books of the Bible, and we saw that they were divided in a lot of categories, but we can basically divide them in historical books, poetic or books of wisdom, and prophetic books. Give me an example of a historical book. Chronicles. Chronicles, yeah, but first, second Chronicles. Um, yeah. First, Acts. Acts would be a, a New Testament historical book. Numbers. Numbers. So a lot of the Old Testament books, uh, first, second Kings, first, second Chronicles, uh, Genesis, his history, uh, uh, so all that kind of stuff. So historical books. What about the poetic books? There's five poetic books. Can we name them all tonight? Psalms. 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 Job. Proverbs. Proverbs. Um, Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes. Song of Song of Song of Song. And Song of Solomon. All right. So we, we find that there are five poetic or wisdom books. And then we have a prophetic book, 17 uh, prophetic books. There's some coffee if you'd like a cup of coffee on the way in. Uh, there are prophetic books. Give, give me the names of a few prophetic books that we saw last week. What would be some? The Minor and the Major. Yeah, the Minor and the Major Prophets. Could you name me a major prophet? Isaiah, Jeremiah, Jeremiah Ezekiel, Ezekiel <laughs> Daniel, these are major prophets, major prophets. Give me an example of some minor prophets. Habakkuk, Habakkuk Amos, Amos, Joel, Joel, Joel Jonah, 
Jonah, what, what makes it, why do we call them a major or a minor prophet? This book. The size of the book, exactly. Uh, you know, Jeremiah, maybe one of the longest ones, a big, big, long book. Uh, Ezekiel, big books. Uh, Isaiah, big yes. books. But those other ones are smaller books, right? So we, we looked at those divisions and, and we kind of examined that a little bit last week. We talked a little bit about the Apocrypha. Uh, and, and why is it that contrary to Catholics, we would not agree that the Apocrypha is part of inspired scripture? Not inspired. Yeah, why would we say that? Why would we? There's why? no tradition. They come never, 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 never quoted, quoted by Christ. Christ. Never quoted by Christ. Uh, the Jews did not accept them as inspired books. Uh, they contradict some of the doctrines of scripture. And so for those reasons, basically, uh, we, don't, we don't endorse them. We don't uh, believe that they're inspired books. It doesn't mean that you can't read them. Uh, you can read them. They're interesting books. There's all kinds of interesting information in them. But, but we don't see them as being inspired books. Uh, and, and primarily because they advocate certain things that, that we don't uh, believe that the rest of Scripture speaks about. Then we talked about the different books of uh, the New Testament. Uh, we looked at the, uh, some of the main points in them, and you can look at those yourself. It's kind of good to have, a, to kind of have a, uh, a general knowledge of New Testament books and what the theme of each book is, all right? And just for an example, we talked about this last week, you might remember, Matthew. What, what's the general theme of Matthew's Gospel? The King. Jesus Christ is the King, he's the Messiah. Who, Messiah. who did Matthew write to principally? The Jews. To the Jews, right? Uh, you know, uh, John, well, what was the theme of John's book? Jesus is God. Jesus is God, and, 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 and what, what verse is kind of outstanding that Five, speaks about the entirety of the book? 539, that uh, by believing in him, you have life. You life. might life, have life eternal, or, or later on in the book where he says, these things have been written, yeah, that, that you might know, know that you have yeah. eternal life. John 3, 3, which is important. All right, so a lot of important verses there that are extremely important. You've been very good students. You know all the answers, and uh, very, very good. All right, well, let's, let's go on tonight, uh, looking at the inspiration of Scripture. And uh, let me ask you a question. If an unsaved person came to you and said to you, prove to me that the Bible is inspired, what would you say to them? That's exactly what I'd say. <laughs> Can you prove to an unsaved person the Bible is inspired? The events that were predicted in the Old Testament that yeah. came to pass in the New Testament. And of course, from our perspective, that makes sense now. But from then, it was very much forward-looking prophecy. Exactly. So there's, there's prophecies in the Bible that, would be, that you could use to uh, indicate that uh, the scriptures uh, are inspired. What, what other things might you want to tell them? It's kind of the same thing where I was just thinking of Isaiah 53 being fulfilled. Yeah, for fulfillment of same. Isaiah 53, Christ the, the suffering servant. All right. Well, we're going to look at, at several things that we can talk about. But one thing that's really important to remember is that it's very hard to convince an unsaved person of any spiritual truth. I was thinking that. Yeah, definitely. because, you know, uh, you know they, they, they might mentally agree with you just because they want to agree. But down in their hearts, they want it. If anybody really believes the Bible is inspired, they're going to get down into the book and start reading it. If anybody believes it's an inspired book of truth, they're going to get right into the Word of God and want to find out what it is that God requires. So, how would you define inspiration? If I were to ask you, give me your definition of inspiration, what, what, would, you, what would you say? I go to 1 Timothy 2 15. Mm -hmm. All right, and you can quote that, I'm sure, for us. So, what, what, what's that? Well, All right. I didn't understand what you said. What did you say? First Timothy 3.15. First Timothy 3.15. All scripture is inspired of God and is profitable yes. for Quran. Right? So, the Bible. Okay, so how, how would you phrase that to a person? That's what the verse says. You're talking to somebody. How would you tell them that means the Bible is inspired? Well, let me put it to you this way. In a sense, what the Bible is saying is it is claiming inspiration for itself. Uh, the Bible is saying that it is inspired. And so inspiration is really the, the process where God has been overseeing uh, and, and directing men to write scripture. Uh, and, and it's a process where he's the instigator. He's the one that moved on the hearts of people 
uh, to write and, and to use their personality. You know, you, you read certain books of the Bible, you see the personality of the person. Mm -hmm. You read the books of Peter, 1st, 2nd Peter, you see Peter's personality. You, you read John, John is outstanding. John's called the Apostle of Love, so you read his Gospel and you get that sense where there's a great love for Christ and, and love comes up often, uh, the love of God for us in the Gospel of John. And, and then you go to 1st, 2nd and 3rd John and uh, you see again that that emphasis so you see that in all of his writings so you, personality style uh, are all there but it produces authoritative scripture and and for us it's really important to understand why we believe scripture is inspired the, the unsaved person has a hard time with it because the natural man does not receive the things of god uh, because they're discerned spiritually so there's, there's got to be a work of God in the life of a person for them to really understand that. That's why we believe, I believe, and I know many of you believe, that in the sovereignty of God in salvation, that God must move sovereignly on the heart of a person to bring them to believe, otherwise they can't. That's why Jesus said if the Father doesn't draw them, they can't come. There has to be the work of God. Yes. And we are not to try to defend the Bible. The Bible will defend yeah. itself. Yeah, we don't need to defend the Bible. The Bible certainly does. It uh, defend itself. You know, you come like a lion, you have him in a cage. He, he, he can take care of him. Let's open up the door. Yes. And he'll take care of him. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So the, and the Bible is well able to do that. So we want to we want to look at, at you know, why, how, how do we know that the Bible is the inspired Word of God? Well, the primary thing is that the Scriptures claim it. Uh, the Bible itself claims that it is the Word of God. And so when you read through the Scriptures, the Bible speaks for itself. The Old Testament prophets, how they start to speak? Thus says the Lord. This is what God says. And, and so they were saying right then that this is the Word of God. And then there's the whole aspect of the, the sovereignty of God in preserving Scripture. You know, if I, if I reason through the process, if, if I believe God exists, and I do, and I know you do, then I believe that that God will want to reveal Himself to us. Uh, he will want to reveal Himself through His Word because words are the most trustworthy things that we have. Uh, so he reveals himself through his word. So it's consistent that if God's going to give us his word and reveal himself through the word, he's going to protect the word. He's going to protect his word down through the ages. And so we believe that God in his sovereignty has really preserved his word all through the years and, and preserved it perfectly for us. And um, so the Bible is its own best source of information when it comes to uh, inspiration. And if somebody could read for me 1 Thessalonians 2.13. 1 Thessalonians 2.13. Because Paul claimed that uh, the, the message he and the other apostles were proclaiming was really the Word of God. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 2.13. If somebody could read that, anytime, anybody who finds it, just go ahead and read it. First Thessalonians 2.13. And for this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received from us the word of God's message, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for it, what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. All right, so here's Paul saying that, you know, you've, you've received what we said as the Word of God. So he's really claiming for himself uh, inspiration or the inspiration of the, of the books that he's written. And so Paul's given us like, what, two-thirds of the New Testament? Uh, uh, Three-quarters of the New Testament? He's given us a lot of the New Testament, and he claims inspiration for that. In the Old Testament, we've already mentioned that that often the prophets would say, God has said, or the Lord has said, or this is the word of the Lord. And so that the scripture repeatedly uses those terms uh, referring to its own divine inspiration. Uh, a little while ago, uh, Hilton brought up 2 Timothy 3.16, that all scripture is given by what? Inspiration of God. So every book that qualifies to be scripture, and we'll see what that is a little bit later on, uh, qualifies uh, as, as inspired. Now, inspired is a very uh, interesting word. Show me what inspiration looks like. Can I show you? Yeah. Yeah, inspiration is, that's inspiration, right? 
But whenever we think of God giving us the word, we don't think of, we think of, right? Uh, right, so the word inspired really means God breathed. It means God breathed. Why we've translated as inspire is kind of interesting, but we won't get into that tonight, but it really means God breathed or God breathed out the word. And, and yet, you know, the, the, the writers of scripture didn't fall into a trance. This is not trance writing. Uh, they, they didn't like pass out and, and all of a sudden there it was. Uh, you know, they, they just basically said, I think I'm gonna sit down and write this. And they, they wrote and God inspired them. God moved upon them and they wrote it. Did they know that they were writing scripture when they did it? I don't know, maybe some of them did, maybe some of them didn't. Uh, I think particularly the prophets of the Old Testament, maybe they had a keen sense that God was really inspiring them. But there's that fact that God just breathed it out. And, and Paul makes explicit claims uh, that, that his word is from the Spirit of God, that God has given him this word. Somebody look up for me, 1 Corinthians 2, 12 and 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. I won't look at all the passages here tonight because there's too many of them, but you, you basically look at some of the stuff in your lesson. But 1 Corinthians 2, 12 and 13. Can somebody just read that for me when you find it. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So there's Paul talking about the things that he's received. He's received the things of the Spirit. And, and they're, they're not things from the Spirit of man. They're things that come from the Spirit of God. That God has moved upon the hearts of people. That God has worked in them uh, to, to write these words down that are truly Scripture. And so the sovereignty of God is, is really important when you're talking to people about inspiration. And it's very important that, that when you talk to people about this, if they're not believers, of course, you know that God's got to convince their heart. It's got to come from Him. But they need to understand that a God who truly loves His people is that God's going to want to reveal Himself. Uh, it's unheard of to think that a God would love His people and not reveal Himself to them. Uh, that, that should be the greatest desire. I mean, when we love people, we want to communicate. That's, that's the first thing that we do. We talk with people. We, we communicate with people and we love people. And so it's a very natural process, very important process. And, uh, and, and we need to remember that God is in control of everything, even his word. And so he, we, we have a text of scripture that we've had for hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of years that are before us, uh, that have really uh, been, been confirmed by the church at least for 2,000 years. The church has confirmed these New Testament books. Uh, Israel, God's people for, for many thousands of years, uh, confirmed that these were the books that God had given to them. And, uh, and so and with the consensus of the church, consensus of the Old Testament, this is nothing new. Uh, you know, th there, there, there are few people that have ever been able to raise any kind of argument that would lay any doubt against the Word of God. Uh, I, I remember one time uh, when we were doing evangelism out at the front here, uh, during the sidewalk sale, we had, a, we had set up a table and we had literature there. And, and uh, I had some New Testaments that I was given out and a guy came up and, and he said, I offered him one. He said, oh, I don't want one of those. It's full of contradictions. Mm -hmm. So I gave him one. I said, show me one. And he was blank. You know, it's, it's so easy to say the Bible's full of contradictions and yet not know any. And uh, he probably never read the Bible in his life. And in fact, I knew of two passages that seem to contradict each other, but they don't. And so I took him there and I proved my point. I said, you see these two passages, they seem to contradict each other, but when you study, you know, the original language, they don't contradict each other at all. And, and so a lot of people will throw that at us, kind of like as a smoke screen to stop us in, in what we're doing, but they themselves don't really understand. And so, you know, there, there has been, there have been many, many years of the presence of the Word of God with us where people, if, if it were not true, could have proven it true, meant not untrue many, many times and have not been able to do that, even though there are people that are still uh, attempting to do that. They try to prove that it's not true, and by trying to prove it, they were converted. 
Yeah, a lot of them. Yeah, we had there's a lot of testimonies of people who tried to prove and ended up being converted because they realized that it was really true. And and uh, you know, I, I I I love it when I one of my one of the things I like to do is when I witness, I like to use the word of God more than even my testimony, because my testimony can't save anybody, but the word of God can save somebody. And uh, and when I visit with people, I'll sometimes use a scripture just to get the word of God into their minds. Or uh, I often take funerals for funeral companies and. And I do funerals for families that are not Christians, and I use a lot of scripture, just getting the word in there. Not long ago, I did a, a funeral not knowing that there was a Jewish man present sitting at the very front, and he looked like he was totally uninterested. He was slouched down in the chair. He had his head down. And uh, I read several Old Testament passages, uh, Psalm 23, those passages. And at the end of the service, he made a beeline for me at the door, and I thought, oh, man, he's coming to chew me out or tell me how boring it was or whatever. He says, I want to tell you how much I appreciate the way you read my scriptures. The Old Testament scriptures. He says, I particularly like the way you read Psalm 23. And I, I, I try to do it on purpose. You know, in church, you kind of read the scripture. But when I'm at a place like that, there's a lot of unsafe people. I put a lot of emphasis on different passages and pauses to make people think. You know, you do all kinds of little things to ask the Holy Spirit to really reveal truth to people. And uh, so you never know what God's going to do when you're using scripture, even in the midst of a conversation, you know. Uh, you know, people will say to you, there's so much trouble going on in the world. And, and I'll always say, well, that's, you know, that's what the book of Job says. Man is born for trouble as sure as the sparks fly upward. And you just kind of get a little verse in there. And it's amazing the impact that it can have on people. It can open up a conversation and, and lead people to all kinds of, of information. All right. I want to go on now to the, the, the canon of scripture. The canon of scripture. Can tell me anybody tell me what that means? The canon of scripture, and it's not a canon in a fort anywhere with verses in it. <laughs> well, what would you say is the canon of scripture? Those books that were chosen to be contained as books of the Bible. Exactly. They're really the books that qualify. Books that qualify to be an inspired book. What would be some? Um, what would, you, what would you think are some of the qualifiers that would make a book uh, part of Scripture? Well, quoted well, by Christ, definitely. Okay, a, a book that's quoted by Christ. If, if Jesus quoted from certain books, well, then definitely we would include that in the Scriptures. And, and he did, didn't he? Uh, he, he? He actually quoted from the whole Old Testament because he talked about the Law and the Prophets. And when he did, and the Psalms. So when he did that, he kind of encompassed the entire Old Testament, and and so we we have Jesus there uh, giving his his uh, agreement to all of those passages. Well, what else would there be? Uh, anything that's an account of what Jesus did. Okay, an account of his life. So the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All right, um, and and. Also, the apostles talked about each other's writings, you know. Peter talked about Paul's writing. He said some of the things that Paul wrote are difficult to understand, but these are part of the scripture. And so we get that sense that, that they had that, under, that understanding. Uh, prophetic authorship uh, in the Old Testament particularly, thus says the Lord. When a man got up and said, uh, this is what the Lord says. And, and particularly in the Old Testament, when, when the nature of what was being said was prophetic as far as revealing the future. Uh, because what, what were the conditions for a, a prophet in the Old Testament? Do you remember what? There was very serious conditions for a prophet. None of his prophecies could fail. None of them could fail, that's right. If, if a prophet said something and it didn't come true, he it's was what? Yeah, yeah, he's a false prophet. He's a false prophet. false prophet. And and so anybody who said, thus says the Lord, it better happen. Uh, it better be true. And and, and so the, the, those were very important statements. Um, and, and then there's the sense of, of the care, again, of God's word, uh, that God has allowed certain books to remain with us. You know, we believe that there's a third letter to the Corinthians. There's first, second, and third Corinthians, but we don't know where third, it's never shown up on the scene anywhere. There are no copies of it. There's no original. Uh, but we do know that when Paul was writing, he said, and, and the letter that I write to the church at Laodicea, I think it was, uh, make sure you read that letter in the churches also because letters would circulate in the churches. And so the fact that that letter didn't show up is possibly the fact that it's not an inspired letter. 
And so God didn't allow it to come to the forefront and it was never included in Scripture. But we do believe that all we have is what's necessary. We've got everything that we need uh, in the Scriptures. And, and if you're a reader of the Bible, as I'm sure you are, uh, you know that the Scripture cover every subject that could ever come up. Even current uh, things uh, are, are really connected uh, to the uh, to the scriptures and, and so uh, we have a word that's very very complete uh, and and canon really means that these are the authentic books these are the books that fit in in um, the inspiration of scripture and that, there's a lot of references and I think you had some of those to look at in your in your study there um, and, and a lot of New Testament uh, passages validate Old Testament passages uh, for instance uh, the virgin birth of Christ that was prophesied in the Old Testament and happened in the New Testament and uh, so that's very clear uh, the birthplace of Christ uh, was Bethlehem uh, and that was foretold and that's where it happened uh, and, and it's, it's an interesting course of events where Mary and Joseph were in Nazareth and yet that would have been the normal place for him to be born and due to circumstances God got Caesar involved and God Caesar to call for a census and because of the census Joseph had to go to Bethlehem and the baby was born in Bethlehem of a virgin and and so all of for all of these things to happen coincidentally would be impossible but we know them from the Old Testament they were revealed to us and and so a lot of these things are for us very important proofs uh, that the scripture is true uh, the, the, the fascinating book of the New Testament is the book of Revelation uh, and, and the book of Revelation reads like the daily newspaper almost uh, when you look at the events that are going on in the world you know the, the uh, how many how many days that does it happen that Israel is not in the news pretty rare uh, just about every single day Israel is in the news and uh, why so well because Israel is uh, is really the center of focus uh, as far as the end times are concerned and uh, I my, my personal feeling is that I really think that there's going to be a shift in focus from North America where there seems to be all the focus all the time and Europe and the focus as time goes along is going to really shift over to Israel and that's really all that's going to be interesting people are just going to want to be focused there all the time and watching what's going on there okay let's look at the final thing the believability of scripture the believability of scripture and of course as we mentioned because uh, we can't prove inspiration to the lost basically because uh, the, 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 the unbeliever is spiritually dead uh, and he can't comprehend spiritual things that, that's that's so important for us as believers to understand you know when we're talking to people uh, it, it ought to uh, it ought to give us some compassion for the lost uh, because the Bible says that the natural man does not comprehend the things of God. They just don't understand them. And so, you know, I, I'm a big believer that it, it, as far as evangelism is concerned, there ought to be a lot of prayer as we evangelize that God would open the hearts of people to understand. Uh, it's got to be a sovereign work. Why is it that you and I understood? It's because we're, is it because we're spiritually intelligent? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think I'm spiritually intelligent. I'm, I'm rather dull when it comes to that kind of thing. I need the Spirit of God to, to enlighten me. I need the Spirit of God to teach me. And so the world are without that. They don't have the help of the Holy Spirit who reveals the truth to us, reveals the things of Christ to us. And they're, they're incapable of, of really uh, believing in, in the, the reality of the Scriptures. And, uh, and so when we confront them, we need to confront them with the Gospel. Uh, I, I, one of the things I, I don't necessarily do is try to convince somebody of the inspiration of Scripture. If I were to have a conversation like that, I would want to turn that around very, very quickly to presenting the Gospel to that person. Because the person's got to get saved. Then they'll understand why the Scriptures are inspired. Then they'll understand how important they are. And, and of course, only the Holy Spirit can convict a person. And only the Spirit can convince a person that the Scriptures are the Word of God. Uh, you know, I, I grew up in a home that was very religious. Uh, the Bible was not the focus because we were Roman Catholics. Uh, but when I began investigating the scriptures, I immediately had no problem with the inspiration of scripture. It was never an issue for me to try to prove to myself or to anybody else that the scriptures were inspired. I just knew it. 
I just sent, and after I became a Christian, it was just a fait accompli. It, it was just, I, I knew it as I read the scriptures. I knew this had to come from God. I re remember talking to Amir in my office, our, our Muslim friend, and, and he was sharing with me. He says, you know what? He says, I read the Quran and I read the Bible. And he says, I can tell you which book is inspired and it's not the Quran. You know, he said, I know, I, when I read the Bible, I know this is an inspired book. When I read the Quran, I know it's not inspired. I know it's a man who wrote this book. And he says, there's a vast difference between the two. And, and that's extremely important. Well, the purpose of, of the, the uh, importance of, of the reliability of the scripture is really for us as, as believers. We need to understand that the Bible is reliable for us in everything. And, uh, you know, as Christians, we, we need to stick close to the book. Uh, we, we need to understand the book. We need to know the book. Uh, in my years as a Christian, um, what has blessed me the most is, has been my regular reading of the scriptures so that when something happens in my life that I need the support of scripture, I know where to go. I know what passages to go to. I, I love the Psalms, you know. I, 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 I'm like that guy in Job that says that man is born for trouble as sure as the sparks fly upward. I'm always in trouble. And uh, I, I, somebody once said that the more you talk, the more trouble you're liable to get in. And my job involves talking, so I get myself into a lot of trouble. Sometimes I'm in trouble with the unsaved, sometimes I'm in trouble with the saved. And, and I get into all kinds of difficulties, but the Word of God is always my rest. It's always the place that I can go to. Uh, you know, if I, if I sin and I fail God, I know right where to go. Psalm 51, Psalm 38, Psalm 32. The, that, that's, that's my neighborhood. That's where I hang out when I'm not feeling good. So if you ever catch me reading Psalm 38, you know I've just been in trouble. And because uh, those are important passages for me. You know, if I, if I want encouragement, uh, if, I, if, I, if I want to be really encouraged, uh, I'll, I'll read some of the, the epistles uh, where Paul writes to encourage the believers, like uh, Philippians and, and that kind of a book, Ephesians, uh, important books. If, if, I, if I'm having to make a decision, I'm going to want to go and park in Proverbs, you know, and, and really get into the Proverbs and read the Proverbs and study them. And, 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 and listen, I'll tell you something. I've been reading the Bible now for not as long as Hilton. <laughs> 37, 38, 38, 40, 40, 42 years, all right? I've been a Christian for 42 years, so I've been reading the Bible for 42 years. And uh, I want to tell you something. Sometimes things hit me just now, at this point. Just, all of a sudden, I'll be reading it. Bang! I've been reading this for 40 some years, and now all of a sudden, bang! Where'd that verse come from? I never read that there before. And all of a sudden, it just pops off the page. And uh, But God has a way of... of meeting your need at the point where you need it and uh, and you know what sometimes the things we're going through sometimes people tell me I'm, I'm i'm so discouraged i'm so down i don't want to read the word you know that's the best time to read the word because when you're discouraged and you're down that's when god wants to talk to you and and you know or, or sometimes when you, when you feel you ever feel like you can't pray sometimes I, i'm in a place i say well, I, I don't i don't have any words i don't know what to say to you and God, it's like God says, open your Bible, let me talk to you. Let me talk to you first. Then you'll be able to talk to me. And, and you get into the Word and you start reading and, and reflecting on the Scriptures. And, and God says so, so, so much to us. Well, uh, some, uh, yes, my yes. Said, like, uh, I was reading the Bible for a little while. And today, uh, sometime this week again, I heard somebody say something. When, when the Lord came down to Adam, the cool of the day. Yes. In, you know, I have in my mind, and most people I think have in their minds, uh, we said to communicate, to talk with him and different things, but he said, he said the cool of the day in Hebrew is, was the, that, that time is not in, is not the word in, um, you know, the cool time. In okay. God, God was anger. God was what? In, in Hebrew it's, it's anger. Anger? The word, yes. Okay. The word, the cool. Uh -huh. So I think it's a nice thing to check upon that word. Okay, and we'll have a look at that. Okay. Yeah, the most of us, we think that God came down to communicate with him. Okay. And I just with didn't many... think about it. I think it's, uh, it, it okay. seems uh, as though it's truth. All right, all right. Well, let, let's have a look at some of the reasons to, to find the Bible believable. And there's a few that I just want to share with you in closing. First of all, ordinary man wrote the scriptures. You know, God didn't choose the highly intellectual people of the day to write the scriptures. Uh, it was written by ordinary men, people like John and Peter who were 
fisherman and Matthew was a tax collector. He didn't use, use the philosophers of the day, but rather he used ordinary people. There are some exceptions, Solomon, who was a king, David, but by and large, people who wrote the scripture or gave us the scripture were very ordinary people. They're people that are or were where we are. He used the motorcycle again. A motorcycle again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Us. yeah. <laughs> just just regular people yeah. to to give us the scriptures, and and these common men wrote a very uncommon book, uh, a very extraordinary book. There's not a book that's comparable to the Bible. I mean, this book is different than any other book. People have tried to make imitations; they just can't. It's it's a very unique book written over such a long period of time by so many people. Um, and, 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 and there's all kind of, of uh, in, internally consistent facts. When you go through the book from Genesis to Revelation, the, the, the thread of salvation runs through the entire Bible. Uh, the theme is there right through the entire Bible. The, the entire theme of redemption uh, is constantly found there. Even when you read through a book like Esther, like Esther where the name of God doesn't even appear. And, and yet you see the hand of God working in the lives of people. And it, it, it's amazing to see that over a period of 1,600 years with 40 different authors. I mean, how could you do that over such a long period of time with so many authors? How could you compile a book that fits together so perfectly well? Yet the Bible remains without error or contradiction. And, and you know, when, and when people bring that up to you, do what I did, ask them to show you a contradiction. They won't be able to do it. It's, it's impossible. And uh, those who oppose God and His Word have uh, tried for many, many years to discredit the Word of God, done everything that they could. However, nobody has ever found the information in the Bible uh, that can prove it wrong. In fact, history and time tend to prove the Bible right. Uh, you know, as we go along, as there's archaeological discoveries, go ahead. There's, just, there's something extraordinary about that because when you look at most other religions, uh, there's always a central person who writes almost everything. Yes. Uh, and what yeah. Amir's example of, of the Quran is yeah. all written by uh, by Muhammad. Uh, yeah. If you look at um, uh, most of the uh, you know Christian offshoot sects, like the Jehovah's yeah. Witnesses or Mormons, it's all one person who says, "Oh, I got a revelation." Yes. And then yes. they write all kinds of absolute uh, documentation. Yeah. Uh, even the old Greek gods, it was all from the poems of Homer. If I'm yes. not mistaken, or something yeah. like that. So most other world's religions, they all have a central person who wrote almost everything. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and they right. become the authority, whereas there's no such thing in, yeah. uh, in, 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 in ultimately, the head of our uh, religion, Jesus, did not write a thing himself. Yeah, exactly. People yeah. reported him. That's something yeah. rather quite unique when all the other ones, the guru is the one who writes everything he's out over here. Yeah, exactly. you know, they self proclaim their own word, whereas Jesus did not self proclaim any of his writings. It was all done. That's by a very him. good point. That's very, very, very important. Yeah, that's yeah. a very good point. Yeah. Yeah. That's like uh, um, Carl Russell. He's your yeah. witness. Jehovah's Witness, yeah. Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith, Smith of yeah. all these yeah. others. Yeah. They, they, all, they all claim they all have the inspiration and they wrote, you know, and they wrote. They, that's it. They wrote and they wrote and they wrote, but, yeah. but they become the central point. Whereas in the Bible, even if you were to say one person, you were to remove them, the rest of the Bible also remains. Yeah, that's even right. if you were to take out King David, yeah. the rest remains. Yeah, everything stays. Yeah, everything stays. Yeah. And everything yeah. is tied up in the Bible together. Yeah, yeah. and it doesn't change anything. Uh, if, you, if you remove them, it's, so it's, it's extraordinary. It's yeah, extraordinary it's, over so much period of time. Ab absolutely. So you know, it's written by ordinary men. Uh, it's internally consistent right through. Uh, it's powerful. The Bible has changed the lives of people. Changed my life. Changed your life. Uh, it changed the lives of people who wanted to find errors in it and who were converted as a result of it. Uh, because the word of God is powerful. It's quick and sharper than any two-edged sword. And and so it's an extremely powerful book. Uh, it's historically accurate. That's the other thing that's interesting. It's historically accurate. I was watching a, um, uh, 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 a documentary on TV the other day. I have Apple TV, so I get some little things that you can't get on normal television. And I was just fascinated by uh, the Shah of Iran. And uh, because uh, talking to Amir a while back, uh, he talked to me a lot about Persia and how Iran was originally Persia and the Shah of Iran, and, and, and the Shah of Iran was in, that, that, that kind of ruler was in power for, is it 1,500 years or 2,500 years, uh, when finally he was sent out of the country, and that was the end of the monarchy in, in, in Iran. And uh, what was I going to tell you with that? Now I get onto these subjects and forget what, I'm, what I was going to tell you. But anyhow, I was fascinated 
watching this and oh yes oh yeah because when I was talking to Amir he was talking about how fascinating he was reading Ezra and Nehemiah because they talk about the king of Persia and he says that's my people because he says even though I'm from Iran I'm originally Persian and and how fascinating that whole thing is and we were talking about these things and he was telling me that that uh, our scriptures the Old Testament scriptures confirm exactly what he learned in history about his country of Persia and the kings of Persia and so it's fascinating that our our, our scriptures are historically correct and and time proves it as we go along in time it's being proven over and over uh, that it's historically correct and then Jesus Christ himself is the center of scripture and he confirms the reliability of scripture if Jesus quotes from the Old Testament then I can trust him. I can trust that he's everything that he said he was. I can believe that he, he had men write about his life in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I can believe that what he said about the Spirit coming and teaching them things that they couldn't learn now was what was going to come out of all of that. And I can, I can believe all of the rest of scriptures. And, and Jesus spoke about a lot of things. He, he spoke about the law and the prophets. He talked about Jonah. Somebody mentioned that a while ago, I think, maybe you Carlton, I'm not sure. He, ta he talked about Jonah. Uh, and, and he talked about Sodom and Gomorrah. You know the big debate about what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah? Was it just a cataclysm? Or He talked about Sodom and Gomorrah. And so we have all their, those proofs. And there are, there are various prophecies concerning the Messiah. We've mentioned already the birthplace uh, place of the Messiah. Uh, 700 years before he was born. I mean, how, how, how could you do that coincidentally? Just pick the right place where he's going to be born 700 years previous. Uh, there, there's the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem that is recorded 700 years before in, Jer in, um, in Zechariah. Uh, the crucifixion and the suffering of Christ in Isaiah 53 that we've mentioned already. Uh, all of those prophecies uh, help us as believers to have a real confidence in the scripture and the word of God. So it was written over a period of 16 centuries, 14 different authors, and it's remarkably consistent. Its prophecies are, are being fulfilled. They have been fulfilled in the past. Uh, events that were prophesied hundreds of years ago occurred and were fulfilled. So it's really historically accurate. So we've got a, a book that we can put confidence in. We have a scripture that we can really put confidence in and uh, really, really trust and know to be the Word of God. Well. We're going to close there for tonight. We're going to go on with how to know the Bible is your next lesson, I believe. So if you want to start working on lesson number two, how to know the Bible. Now, I wanted to have a look at some of your lessons, so I asked you to kind of tear them out. Maybe I didn't mention that when everybody was here. I just kind of would like to glance at them and see how you're doing. So if you've got them pulled out, you want to just put them together. I see a couple already there. That I